This interview is with one of our newest St. Andrews physicists, Dr. Sebastian Schulz. We discuss the cultural shock of moving to Canada, how to keep spirits up when work isn't going well, and the TV talent show he's not a fan of. Enjoy listening! You're listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Lavery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. So today on Insight, we're interviewing Dr. Sebastian Schultz, a nanophotonics lecturer at St. Andrews. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So could you tell us a bit about your positions here at St. Andrews? So at the moment, my position is very simple because I've only started about six weeks ago. Um, so I'm a lecturer, which means I'm starting from next year. I'll be involved in teaching the, uh, some of the courses in the department both um, laboratory-based and classroom-based, um, and I'll also be building up my own research group on nanophotonics. Okay, and could you tell us what path led you to your position here? Um, so I did my degrees, both my undergraduate and PhD here in St. Andrews, and then I uh, did a four-and-a-half-year postdoc in Canada at the University of Ottawa, and then a short one-year stay in Ireland at the Cork Institute of Technology, and now I've returned. Welcome back. So could you tell us a bit about your uh, research then? <laughs> yeah, so my research um, focuses on using nanostructures, so structures that have at least one of their dimensions uh, smaller than a micron to uh, control and manipulate light um, and so this is both for applications so especially the telecommunications industry um, there's a big push to bring let's say instead of having fiber to the home have optical fiber or fiber light connections connecting the hard drive of a computer to the processor and so that needs miniaturized components but it's also a very good test bed for for fundamental physics so you can do a lot of analog effects to effects from condensed matter or quantum mechanics. Um, but it's much easier often to set up an experiment working with light and to make an artificial structure that manipulates light than to kind of invent new materials. Okay, so it has quite a large range of applications yeah. then from infrastructure to kind of in your home to fundamental physics. Yeah. Okay, and what is your favorite thing in or about your field of research then? I think uh, the favorite thing is especially this, um, the broadness of it. So it includes a lot of physics coming in from different um, fields. You can use the same language as quantum mechanics or condensed matter to describe your, your systems. But there's also applications to, to biology. So when you go to a conference, you can hear one talk on using photonic devices and diagnosing bacterial infections in a hospital and then the next talk can be about fundamental quantum mechanics and okay. i think that's quite a quite interesting and keeps involved in a in a wide range of interesting topics does it give you the opportunity to go to conferences that aren't physics based then um it could so i my work is focused on very much the physics underlying the devices so i personally tend to go to physics based conferences but um for people working more on biosensing, there is scope, for example, to go to biology conferences and or medical conferences as well for imaging techniques and this. Okay. And did you set out to end up in nanophotonics or did you have a different research <coughs> aim when you were an undergrad? When I was an undergraduate, I thought I would end up doing condensed matter physics. And then I did a uh, summer project um, in my final summer, so before entering the final year. And I decided that as a rounded physicist, I should have done something with light at some point in my career. And since I wasn't going to do a PhD in that topic, now would be a good time. 
And so I did a summer project, which was in the group of um, Professor Kraus at the time. And then I really enjoyed it. So I did my final year project with the group and really enjoyed that. So I did my PhD with the group and ended up doing the field that I thought I would never work in. So that undergraduate um, internship was also here? Huh? Yeah, that was also here. So do you have any advice for anyone who's intimidated by the complex naming and terminology in fields of physics or science? Um, I think the best advice is don't worry about it too much at the beginning. So the terminology and the naming can be complex, but in the end, it doesn't take that long to pick it up. And in any field that you go in, there'll be complex terminology and and naming. Okay, because obviously nanophotonics is a, it's a little bit scary, a little bit hyper. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> and not as bad as some of them, I guess. So could you describe your experiences of Ottawa a bit as the capital city of Canada? It was probably quite the change from St. Andrews, I imagine. It was quite the change from St. Andrews, even just, I mean, in a lot of ways, just by scale. So it's a city which the wider region hosts close to a million people which is not quite the same scale as St. Andrews. Um, but actually, compared to some other cities, the change wasn't probably as extreme because Ottawa is still a city that kind of maintains a relative small town feeling. <clears throat> so there's a lot of almost contained neighborhoods that have restaurants, bars, movie theaters, shops, where you could happily live and only leave your neighborhood once every three or four weeks. Um, and so that, I'd say, resembles more the, the St. Andrews lifestyle, that you are in the same place and leave it about once a month for, <laughs> for a short <laughs> afternoon. Um, I mean, on the other hand, of course, being a capital city has, let's say, a lot of advantages. There's an airport close by, there's not you know, 10 cinemas, not one. There's, just every, there's more of everything. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. So apart from the extra million people, it was <laughs> kind of close to St. Andrews. So what was one thing that you enjoyed about living in Ottawa and what was one thing that you missed from St. Andrews? So I really enjoyed in Ottawa the, uh, like the environment of living in Canada. So it's a very uh, kind of relatively open, multicultural and very welcoming society that makes it very easy as somebody moving in to integrate quickly um, and the other thing I'd say is the weather I really enjoyed having 30 degrees in summer and minus 30 degrees in winter um, I think what I missed from San Andrews a lot is the kind of the picturesque town with the location I like water and while Ottawa has some rivers and the canal having the ocean and having west sand east sands castle sands is, is quite something different and much nicer than walking along a, a river. And what was the largest cultural shock that you experienced? Probably not the weather. <laughs> oh, well, that was big. I think the largest cultural shock of moving to Canada was that things are extremely similar, but not quite the same. And I think that almost is more of a culture shock than landing somewhere where everything is completely different. And so I think it was that um, there can be a lot of things that, that you don't quite expect. If you just picked out an individual person or an individual building and placed it somewhere in Britain, it wouldn't feel out of place or look out of place at the first moment. But then when you talk, you realize that things are different, that attitudes are a little bit different that after all you do realize that you are North America so kind of in a lot of things portions for food are a bit bigger than they are in, in Europe nowhere near as bad as it is in the States where they're absolutely <laughs> massive and so Canada I'd say is an excellent middle way but just the the almost the same but slightly different these small things that sometimes throw you off a little bit I'd say were the culture shock of moving to Canada. Interesting. Was there any uh, social faux pas that you made because of the, the slight differences? Not that I'm aware of. Not, not that you're aware of. Was there something that you were looking forward to about Canada before you went? 
So I'd been there for a job interview before I went. And um, so one thing that I was really looking forward to is having seen it for the, the city of Ottawa, because it is very nice. Um, and then one of my hobbies is fishing. So obviously Canada is well known for its fishing. So I was looking very much looking forward to to do fishing. And then um, there's a canal in Ottawa that in winter freezes over and becomes a skating ring. So I was very much looking forward to skating on, on that canal. That sounds magical. <laughs> wow. Um, how long did you spend in Canada then for the job interview? For the job interview was two days for the interview and then I stayed for an extra two days to to get a better impression of the city. So four, four days to size up the uh, the capital yeah. city, that was enough. Did you find any differences in the university due to size differences such as working in a larger research group for instance? Um, so the research group itself wasn't that different in that um, the group of Thomas Krauss here was quite a, a large group. Um, so there's a difference in the group that I went there was starting fresh. So they started with four people and ended up with 35 by the time I left. Um, there is difference in, I think, the working university and let's say that the bigger the university gets, the slower bureaucracy probably tends to get. So in, in St. Andrews, a lot of things are kind of within the department to support research or there's a dedicated person for the physics department and then the department is quite small so one person can do an excellent job for everyone in the department and in the bigger university in Ottawa you could see that the bureaucracy was sometimes taking much longer than I was used to from St Andrews. Was that quite frustrating then at times? Could, could be frustrating I think mm -hmm. at some point I waited three or four months to get a contract for renewal and that was a bit frustrating because you want to sign your contract and be done with it and focus on your research. Mm. And you said that the research group had 35 people when you left. Is that is that typical outside St. Andrews? Because I can't imagine anywhere here having 35 people in the one research group. Um, well, it was one research group, but it contained, let's say, several subgroups. So there was one overarching professor, but then there were... Um, three assistant professors, which is the equivalent of a lecturer that formed part of it. So in that respect, it's not that like it is a big group, but there are other universities. And even within St. Andrews, you can have um, cases where, let's say, there's one research group and then as more junior members become independent, if you count them as forming part of the group, then you can also get to large groups. If you count them as a separate group, then then they're smaller. Okay. And do you feel that working in a larger university gave you more opportunities to access more specialists and specialist equipment? Um, so it's hard to answer for me because actually the specialist equipment that I need, St. Andrews is quite well equipped. So I need the clean room nanofabrication facilities and because nanophotonics and has been like a strong point of St. Andrews for quite some time, there's good facilities here, probably better than most other universities of that size would have. Um, so for me, there wasn't a big difference in the facilities available from St. Andrews to Ottawa. So no shiny new toys to try out over there? <laughs> there were shiny new toys um, because I said the group was being started, so the university was expanding in that area. So lots of toys were being bought in new, which is great because they're shiny new. But sometimes the tool that has had the recipe established 10 years ago and has worked faultlessly 10 years and all the faults have been ironed out is sometimes preferable to the shiny new tool where nobody quite knows yet how it's going to behave when you use it for the first time. That makes sense, yeah. Was that a bit intimidating then, being the part of the f starting group? Um, no, I, I didn't see it as intimidating. I think it was um, a very good experience because starting my own group now, I have gone through some things that uh, maybe you wouldn't normally go through as a postdoc. 
Um, and so now I think I'm probably quite well equipped in the struggles of, of starting a new group of planning what equipment to buy. Um, and so I think it was a good experience. Fantastic. Um, do you prefer living in a city or do you like the smaller country towns? I like the smaller country towns. I like green space, fresh air, view of the ocean, things like that. And that's more accessible and certainly more affordable in smaller country towns than big cities. Very <laughs> true. So are there any specific goals that you hope to achieve now that you've returned? You've, you've mentioned this uh, research group that you want to start up. Yeah, so I think um, a goal is to get a research group running that gets recognized internationally as being a, a good group to work in and that does good research in nanophotonics. And how is that going to slot into the other nanophotonics research that goes on here? So there is overlap with the group of um, Dr. DeFalco. Um, but I think there's excellent uh, opportunity to complement each other. And so the way it will go in is that probably most groups will kind of have their own core and then where the groups overlap there everybody has slightly different expertise so where there's overlap that can complement each other to to help support each other as well so either sharing of equipment or sharing of knowledge and do you have a kind of time scale that you want to to work to um well, I want to say as quickly as possible. Um, I mean, I realize you're only six weeks but, in. But, so. but of course, um, things take time. And the the time scale is always dependent on, on money. And that is dependent on success in grant writing. And so if a first batch of grants is very successful, then there's suddenly a lot of money and things can happen quickly. And if that's a bit less successful, then it's going to take a bit longer and you have to maybe pick a bit more carefully what the first experiment is, what can be done with the, the equipment and the people that is already here. But so yeah, there's no, no exact time scale. And the important thing to remember is that when you plan a time scale, you're normally wrong. It mostly takes longer and sometimes you're lucky and it goes a bit quicker, but it rarely goes exactly the time that you plan. You can't put in your mistakes before you know what they're going to be. Yeah. So um, after you've got this uh, research group set up, could you see yourself moving to another university for research after St. Andrews? Especially when planning and setting up, it's best to plan to be here in the long term. And it is having seen the new group being set up by an established professor in Ottawa, it, it is an opportunity, but it also is a lot of work to set up a new group. And it does, let's say, initially slow down the output. So in the ideal world, I would see myself having a very productive group in St. Andrews for, for quite some time to come and reap the benefits of the work put into setting up the group. Fantastic, because the community will benefit from that as well. So what is the oddest thing that you've spent money on for research then? I haven't really spent money on many odd things because most of the things that I use as a, a light source a detector and then bits of silicon or metal that get patterned to do an experiment. Um, the oddest thing we ever did as a group was spent by somebody else, but we needed titanium dioxide powder for an experiment. And so we asked one of them, and so titanium dioxide is a mass produced chemical commodity because for example, it goes into paint, sunscreen and this. So we asked a company for the, how much it would cost to get the smallest sample amount that they hand out for people to try out their material. And they said nothing. And um, so we said, great, send it to us. And I think we got sent 50 kilos when we were looking for about five grams. <laughs> wow, 50 kilos. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a very big dioxide. bag of white powder that would probably be a lifetime <laughs> supply for uh, many, many research groups. 
Wow, okay, so you can take that long to conferences and give it away yourself. You need to be careful how you do that, it might look a bit suspicious. <laughs> so um, how do you celebrate your research or teaching going well? So I am a fan of good whiskies. So if I get a very good result or a nice paper published, it generally is a nice glass of whiskey. Presumably after, after you've left the lab. In the evening <laughs> at home to, to celebrate. And what do you do to keep your spirits up when they aren't going so well? Um, sometimes it can be exactly the same uh, glass of whiskey that is being used to celebrate. Um, Benka, I generally don't need too much picking up because I think an important thing to realize is that failure or mistakes are part of research. Research is based on trial and error. You don't just make and succeed. You make and don't succeed. And then you look at it and you revise and see what you could do better. What can you do ne different next time? Um, both it can sometimes be that you made a silly mistake that you can avoid always in the future. And sometimes the reason that it didn't work is something that you didn't know. And that again means you learned something and you then revise your, your experiment going forward. So to me, I think that's part of the uh, part of the job is to have things not go that well. So it's a very optimistic answer. It's every opportunity is a learning opportunity yeah. kind of thing. And um, what's a concept or topic that you struggled with when you were a student? Thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. I think uh, I best heard it summarized at a conference where somebody was pulling up an equation and said, as we all know from teaching thermodynamics, because let's realize that most people don't understand it when they come across it the first time round. I certainly didn't understand it the first time round. I still don't claim to have the best understanding of thermodynamics, but it significantly improved because during my PhD, I was a tutor for the second year physics course. So at least that part of thermodynamics, I revisited three years in a row. I think by the end of it, I had a much better understanding of it. And have you tried to veer away from it as much as you can because of that, apart from the um, tutoring? So it doesn't come up too often in, in my work. Um, but that is by coincidence, not, not design um, that I don't need, let's say, the two advanced concepts of, of thermodynamics too often. Um, but I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't really try and avoid it if, if necessary. I'd sit down and revisit it and hopefully understand it this time around. Good luck if it rears its head. Um, so what is something that you think St. Andrew's students benefits from that other university students might not? I think um, because of being <coughs> so remote, um, there's a probably closer student community than in a lot of other universities. So most people, <coughs> if you live in Glasgow, Edinburgh, and go to uni there, you can live an hour by public transit away from the person that sits next to you in lecture in St. Andrews, most people live within a 15 minute walk. So it's much easier to do things and there's probably more of a shared experience. And it means that the sport societies or music societies are all quite, I think an integral and good part and are all well attended because, well, they're, first of all, there isn't a non-university society in most cases for most things, but I think that leads to very good, at least for me, very enjoyable student experience. So it's the very close-knit community. Yeah. So another facet of the uh, community is the St. Andrew's traditions, such as May Dip or Raisin Weekend. I was wondering if you had a favorite tradition? So I have certainly enjoyed Raisin Weekend. Um, I had kind parents, so it being in November, I was my costume that I was dressed up in was appropriate for the time of year, so I wasn't cold or anything, so that was very nice, and my um, raisin present wasn't particularly heavy to carry around, so that was, again, <laughs> very kind uh, academic parents that made this uh, nice. Um, 
I have to admit, the maid that I normally just slept in. <laughs> Most of the time, I didn't didn't uh, stay up that late or didn't wake up that early. Uh, so so that one I kind of quite often just plainly missed. <laughs> I think the it's not an official tradition, but I think the barbecues on the beach on the nice summer days. Those are probably the what most students do that I enjoy the most. That's I mean barbecues on the beach. That is a good tradition even if it's only amongst friends. Um, were there any hobbies that you picked up in North America that you'd like to continue here? Um, I didn't pick up any new hobbies. So even while in St. Andrews, I said I like fishing, I also did um, was in the fencing club and I continued both of those in North America and plan to continue them now here. But so I didn't, didn't really pick up any any new hobby. Did you think that you reached new heights? Was it interesting fishing for a different species? It was it was very interesting having all the different species in North America that you have here. So that was very interesting. And then also in fencing, the club there was a very much higher level than here in that it had a national team members and national team coach which I guess is an advantage of being a city with a million people than a small university. You can have sport clubs reach higher level. So I also got pushed to, to a different level there than, than I was while a student. And you hope to bring back some of that expertise? Then? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. Do you do much traveling for your holidays? Uh, yes, I do. So being living in North America for a few years... It meant that about once a year I would travel back to to Europe and um, then often visit family, but also travel around a little bit. Um, and then there would also be some, let's say, smaller trips, just exploring different parts of Canada. Um, but yeah, I like to travel. Nice. And um, what's the worst TV show, movie or performance that you've endured for a friend's sake? I think um, while at university, one of my flatmates' girlfriend was a big fan of Britain Got Talent. So that was uh, on TV more than I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to quickfire questions. So you can answer these a bit quicker, but feel free to take your time to expand upon your answer. So what's your favourite music genre and favourite song? Favourite music genre is everything related to rock music. Um, from pop rock, alternative rock to heavy metal. <clears throat> favorite song. I don't know if I have a really favorite song, um, but the one of the albums I often go back to is Humanity by the Scorpions. And it is very much because of the intro of the very first song on the album. And what's the name of that song then? Uh, Our One. Welcome to Humanity. This is our one. Fantastic. Uh, do you prefer live music or studio recordings? When I listen in the radio or like on streaming, I prefer studio recordings, um, but I do like seeing music live. Okay. Do you have a favorite non-academic book? Um, I have, let's say, two favorite series. There is the um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series and then the Discworld series. Ah, Those are my favorite fantastic book choices. Yeah, brilliant choices. I'm a big fan. Um, would you rather read a poem or a play? A poem. Do you have a favourite piece of fruit? Um, let's go with strawberry. Strawberries. You, have, you hesitated for a moment there. Do you have to consider it? Between I like the... most food, so I'm very, very <laughs> open to, to eating all the other pieces of fruit as well. Well, well the next question was, do you have a favourite Scottish food? I do like haggis. Haggis, excellent. And what's one snack food that you couldn't live without? Chocolate. Chocolate. Any particular type? Uh, no, all of them. <laughs> all the chocolates. 
So do you prefer to have your time off filled with plans or do you like to go with the flow and be spontaneous? Um, probably a rough outline and then see how it develops. Okay. And how far ahead do you plan those things? Um, normally I have a rough outline for what happens on the weekend, let's say by about Thursday, Friday. That sounds pretty prepared. <laughs> um, are you someone who is always on time to events or do you end up rushing in late? I try to be on time. I don't always succeed. <laughs> and what's the nerdiest or geekiest thing that you love? I'd probably go back to the books <laughs> that I mentioned. I mean, the Discworld's very easy to love. It's such a good thing. So um, this is the finishing question, so you can take some time to, to explain about it. But if you believe that aspiring academics should travel to do research in different institutions and countries, what's the, what's the strongest reason for that? I think the strongest reason for traveling is a, it's one of the best opportunities that comes with being an academic. In very few jobs can you decide to work two years here, two years there and um, see the world while working. Um, and the other one is that uh, every institution is different and the way research is done and funded and organized is a little bit different in every country. So going to different countries or continents to do it does, get, I think, give you a better view and can also give you new ideas to then bring back and maybe do things a little bit different than you would have if you just stayed in one contained place for the whole career. So it's that breadth of experience and yep. being able to take it with you where you go next. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sebastian Scholz, for this interview. Thank you. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Avery. Thanks to all the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our publicity officer, Connor McBride. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrew's Physics Society for our website. Goodbye!